Do most of you have, I'm not looking, you don't have a lot of paper in front of you. So do most of you have my slides somewhere that you can see them? Right? Some of you are smart and have a copy. Okay, so I talk relatively fast. Probably should have been warned about that ahead of time. So, um, yeah, if you don't have it in front of you, I don't know. Um, do your best. I, I'll, I'm, it's all written there. I just, I, I do move pretty fast. Okay. So I'm from the Department of Medical Molecular Genetics. I'm up on the fourth floor here in this building, and so I'm probably a, a bit of a change for you. So I'm a more classically trained geneticist, and so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, go back through um, basic principles of inheritance genetics, and then my goal is to show you why knowing that is going to be important if you want to find genes that contribute to disease. Okay, so I've got just sort of a general, let's see if I can move away from this a little bit, uh, general lecture format, just so, you know, you don't lose the big picture. We're going to review basic patterns of simple Mendelian inheritance. We're going to talk about complications of those because it's really important when you're trying to find genes to be aware of that. We're, I'm going to use it as an example, finding genes in Parkinson's disease because there's a lot of really nice themes there that we're going to then take to finding um, genes use, causing disease using whole exome sequencing. And I'm really only going to talk about complex disease at the end. Um, we've got to do a whole bunch of other material before we can get to that. Okay, so let's just do simple Mendelian inheritance. And if you're trained at all in genetics, genetics, just bear with me. It's a couple slides. But for people who aren't familiar with it, I think it's important to understand that. Okay, so this is autosomal dominant inheritance. And so when you're looking at a chart like this, just to get a sense, um, has everyone in a room seen something that looks like this? And I'll give you a hint. A circle is a woman and a square is a man. Um, so if you knew that, and most of you are giggling, that that is reassuring. Okay, so that's, good. that's a good sign. All right, so this lecture will perhaps have some meaning to most of you. All right, so circles and squares. And so the reason I, I talk about this is I really want you to understand the contrast between this and a couple other pedigree formats and inheritance patterns that we're going to see. So affected individuals are shaded. They're fully shaded in this. And it's dominant because it means if you have one mutation, so a mutation on one of your two alleles, that you have at a particular locus, that is sufficient to cause disease. So people are usually heterozygous. You can find people who are homozygous for autosomal dominant disease. It can be relatively unusual. Sometimes they're more severely affected. Unaffected individuals are people who are not filled in. And I'm talking about something very simple right now. I'll make it more complicated later. In this situation, if you're not filled in, that means you have two normal or wild type alleles at that locus. And if you take yourself up to maybe an hour and a half from now, that could be really powerful for finding genes for disease. If I can contrast people in a family who are shaded and who are not shaded. Okay? The uh, big thing about autosomal dominant transmission is you usually see affected individuals in multiple generations. So when you're thinking about using whole exome sequencing to find genes, seeing individuals in multiple generations, seeing males and females, seeing an affected individual who has roughly half their children affected, half their children unaffected, these are all patterns that you would expect to see if something was autosomal dominant. Okay? Mostly familiar? All right. Autosomal recessive is a very, very different inheritance pattern. Here, an individual to be affected, and here it's the yellow shaded individual right there on the slide, this individual has to have a mutation on both alleles that they've inherited of this locus. So that means they in inherited a mutation on the allele that came from their father and a mutation that came from the allele from their mother. For those of you who want to try to tinkle around with that, getting two mutations from your father is not the same thing. One has to come from the father, one has to come from the mother. And if you don't see that, that's not going to be consistent with autosomal recessive inheritance. Typically see similar numbers of affected males and females. And the big thing about autosomal recessive inheritance is that the affected individuals are all in one generation. So we describe that as horizontal transmission. You might see other affected people that are siblings of this person, but you don't see parents, you don't see children. Okay. Um, you often see what's called consanguinity. That means the two parents are related to each other. So they might be first cousins. You might have other kinds of relationships. The reason that matters is if you have consanguinity, if you have two parents that are related to each other, if they have a common ancestor that carried that mutation, it could come down through both parents. And that could be the reason the person has the disease. Now, to keep you all awake. Well, yeah, <laughs> five minutes into this, I heard it gets really tiring around 5.30, so I'll hope to be gone by then. Um, so I, if you think about this, so a person to get a mutation from their mother and, an, and a mutation from their father, if those two parents aren't related to each other, it'd be very reasonable to assume that there would be a different mutation on each allele. I mean, a different codon, a different position in the gene. 
If those two parents are related to each other, if they're first cousins and you have an affected child, would you expect to see the same mutation being inherited from both parents or still different <coughs> mutations? Okay, this does require some kind of a head nod, some kind of a thought. Think it would be the same? If you're a betting person, I offered the right choice first. Yes, <laughs> you would expect it to be the same. Now think about that as a filter if you were doing whole exome sequencing. If you knew your two parents were related to each other, if you're affected individual, and you were going to try to find that mutation, knowing that you were looking for the same mutation on both alleles would be an incredibly powerful filter for you to be able to use. And so it shouldn't surprise you that some of the very first successes in whole exome sequencing were in families that were consanguineous or the parents were related to each other. So inbred communities, um, often kind of isolated communities. D does that make sense? Okay, so I'm trying to tie it back to why, why I'm giving you all this. Okay, this is X-linked dominant. Um, we don't have as many of these. What that means is everybody has 22 pairs of autosomes. You have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Males have only one X. Females have two Xs. So if something's X-linked dominant, it just means the dominant idea, one mutation's enough to get you the disease. So males and females are both going to have this disease, okay? For males, it will be a mutation on their one and only X. For females, it's on one of their two. But that means whenever a male has children, he passes his X chromosome to his daughters. That's what makes them girls. He's going to pass the mutation to them. So you'd always expect an affected male to have affected daughters. Do you know what he gives his sons that makes them boys? A Y. Okay, I'm talking about things on the X. <laughs> so are his sons going to have the disease? No. Okay, so that's exactly what you'd expect to see in an X-linked dominant. You'd expect to see males who don't pass it on to their sons and males who pass it always to their daughters. And when you look at women, you'd expect them to half the time pass it to their son and half the time pass it to their daughters. And of course, all my examples are perfect in terms of their distributions. Real life is never this good. Okay, so X-linked recessive, okay? Remember the idea of recessive. If you're a woman, you're gonna have to have a mutation on both of your X's. What about a male? He's only got one X. It's still that one X, if they, if they have it, a mutation on it, that's gonna be enough to give them the disease. So what that means is, in an X-linked recessive disease, you very rarely see affected females. And I'm going to give you an example of one of these later. It's always going to be affected males. And in genetics, we put a little symbol inside the woman when we know that she's inherited the mutation. Those of you who think genetics, they don't walk in the room telling you they ha carry a little dot. Um, that's something we just know because we're geneticists. So this man, when he gave his X's to his daughter, had to pass his mutated X. And so they have to be carriers. We know that because we understand inheritance. They don't usually look any different. You can't tell that they carry it by looking at them. But then when this woman reproduces, half of her sons get the mutated X, and they're affected, and half of her daughters become carriers. So just to give you a general pattern, I want you to be, if you're ever in that situation where you're actually going to use whole exome sequencing to find diseases, if you're working with families, looking at them, looking at transmission, who's affected, is it males, is it females, multiple generations, single generations, are all really important clues that are going to make it easier for you to find the gene that's mutated. Okay, so while this looked really easy, um, there are some complications and they're relevant for when we go to whole exome sequencing and complex diseases. So we're going to have to play around with that a little bit as well. Okay, so a little more genetics. There's the problem of a new mutation. Okay, so that means there's no family history of the disease. There's been no one previously reported to have this disease in the family. And then suddenly, boom, someone's born who has this disease. How does that happen? Well, in the course of meiosis, there can be mutations that can occur in DNA. And this would be a case where either from the father or from the mother, there has been a new mutation within potentially, say, a coding region of a, disease, of a gene that's resulting in this individual having the disease. So even though, in many cases, these are dominant disorders, I don't see the pattern I expect to see when I look up in the tree. I don't see affected parents. I don't see affected siblings. But what I will see when I look down this pedigree is when this person reproduces, you'd expect to see half their offspring having the disease. So you're not going to see the right pattern looking up, but you might see the right pattern looking down. You also can see this kind of new mutation, and why I bring it up, God bless you, is because sometimes these kinds of new mutations are lethal, and these people don't reproduce. So when you see disorders that are sporadic, you just see one person in a family, they're not reproducing, 
And I'm going to give you an example of that. You have to think to yourself, could this be dominant or could it be recessive? And how you look for the mutations is going to difference in terms of your prioritization. So a lot of us geneticists, our favorite example of a new mutation is achondroplasia, just to give you a little visual. So this is a person who's a disproportionate dwarf. Okay? Disproportionate because his trunk is a typical size. It's his legs and arms that are short, or they're, um, well, they're short, and the head is normal size. So if you, it's the most common form of dwarfism. So if you've seen a person with dwarfism and they look disproportionate, they almost certainly have achondroplasia. What's striking about it is that about 80% of cases are the result of new mutation. So in many cases, you, set, you see a single individual, no previous history. They tend to reproduce a little bit less frequently, um, and so you may not see as much of the transmission um, down. But this, I wanted to make sure you, you see a visual and you have something to think about. The gene for this has been long known. Um, this is not one of the ones we're looking for a new gene for. The other concept that we have to cover, and then we'll get down to, to more serious business, so we have two of them, is penetrance. Okay? And the reason this matters is I want you to look at this pedigree. And when you first look at it, I hope what you think of is something that looks like autosomal dominant inheritance. And hopefully, I'll make it easy for you, the reason you thought about that is because you've been listening all the way through this lecture and you saw affected males and affected females. You saw parent um, to child transmission. You saw male to male transmission, so you knew this couldn't be on the X chromosome. You saw a father that had an affected daughter. But this person is the one that probably is making you go, hmm, shouldn't she be affected? Okay, and unfortunately, with some autosomal dominant disorders, we have what's called reduced penetrance. That is, you have individuals, we're all confident that she carries the mutation. She has affected children with it. Her father had it. Let's assume it's something relatively rare. But for whatever reason, genetic, environmental, we wave our hands, she carries the mutation, but she doesn't show the disease. And these kind of people can cause you a lot of trouble when you're doing whole exome sequencing. Because supposing she hadn't had those children, supposing she became a nun, okay? If I assumed that she was unaffected and didn't carry the mutation, would I be able to find a mutation in this family? I would keep sifting things out. Everything she carried, I would say, oh, that can't be it, that can't be it, that can't be it. So it's really important to be aware that this can happen, and in some diseases, we think it happens in greater frequency than others. Okay. <clears throat> We're not going to calculate it. We'll, we'll skip that. All right. Um, yeah, we don't want to, uh, sorry, we stole this from, another, from medical students. We make, them, we make them calculate it. All right. So variable expressivity, we won't do that for you. So in some disorders, it's not as extreme as that, where we see no symptoms. Perhaps it's just variable. Their symptoms are less severe. You need to be trained to recognize it, okay? So perhaps it's that they develop the disease later. Perhaps it's that they have some features but not the other. And I think I'm clever enough. I do. I brought you a good example of this. So this is an example of a disorder called Marfan syndrome. And it's very, it's very pictorial. That's why I like it for this purpose, okay? So if you can see down here in this bottom, you can see that every symbol within this pedigree, the pedigree symbol is broken up into four pieces. That's because Marfan syndrome actually can have um, different manifestations. You can have cardiac manifestations. You can have skeletal manifestations. You can have eye abnormalities. And you can actually have death due to, to aortic dissection. So the aorta literally um, blows in, in a euphemistic way. Okay, so what you do when you look through this pedigree is you'll see there aren't that many people that are fully shaded. So the shading here is severe or mild. So this person had features in all four areas. You go over here. This person had features in three areas, but not four. Here's three areas, not four, three areas, not four. And here's a per person who just has features in two areas. So within the same family, the same mutation, certainly, you can still have variability within the phenotype. And in some cases, you might get people who have quite here. Look at this person. This person's feature right here is quite mild. You might totally miss that that person actually carries a mutation and has the disease. Okay? So again, <clears throat> it's very important to be aware of all of these. I just call them complications because they can really cause difficulty when you go to try to map a disease gene and recognize whether or not this gene is a candidate because certain people don't carry the variant. Okay, so what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to tease apart um, a little bit with Parkinson's disease because I'm going to do it as an illustration of a couple more points. And then we're going to do some Mendelian disorders and then we'll kind of speculate about how we could use this for complex disorders. Okay, 
So I'm going to go to Parkinson's disease. And so um, are most of you familiar? Do you know what it is? Have you ever heard of it? All right, it's only 3.15. We can't look that quiet and tired already. All right, so Parkinson's disease is typically an older onset disease, at least what you're going to be most familiar with. <clears throat> most people are familiar with a tremor. Affects males and females, a little more common in males. Okay. I always put this slide in every talk I give because for almost every disorder, with few exceptions, a disorder may be due to contributions of genes, contributions of environmental factors, the interplay of, the, of each of them, but there are often cases, especially of complex disease, that may be entirely due to environmental factors. So I could spend a whole lot of time looking for genetics and never find it. Okay, so you need to be aware of that as well. So one strategy that I'm going to talk about that I use is I try to use families that have multiple people with the disease hoping that I'm loading it for genetics. I could be loading it for common environment, but I'm an optimist and I hope that that's not what I'm doing. So this is Parkinson's disease and um, we name all of our loci um, with park names so that we all know that we're talking about Parkinson's disease. Scattered throughout the genome, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to pick and choose what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on some of these yellows, and I'm going to use this one as an example. thing I want you to, not necessarily know, but be aware of as we go through this, is that there are both autosomal dominant forms of Parkinson's disease and autosomal recessive. So hopefully the, the ideas that we talked about in the earlier slides, you're going to be reminded of them again, and we'll be able to um, appreciate the differences in the genetics. So... This was one of the first um, families in which a mutation was found for Parkinson's disease. So I probably shouldn't have put my little information there. So hopefully you look at this, and hopefully you are confident in, in recognizing that this is autosomal dominant. You do see more affected males than females, but you see male-to-male -male transmission, so you know it's not X-linked. You do see some affected females, so you see affected males and affected females, multiple generations, that's why we're thinking autosomal and dominant. This family has an earlier onset of the disease. They get it in their 40s and 50s, okay? And um, they actually have it due to a mutation in this gene called alpha-synuclein. It was found through traditional positional cloning. It was not found through exome sequencing. There have been a limited number of mutations that have been found in this gene. And because we're talking about DNA variation, I think it's really important that you know that there have also been found entire gene duplications and gene triplications that cause disease, not in this family, but in other families. Okay, so I want you to think about that. If it's a gene duplication, are you going to find it when you do whole exome sequencing? Unlikely, unless you were smart enough to do some other things before you did the study. Probably won't. Might, but you definitely run a risk of not finding it. It's um, a mechanism that in some diseases is more common than in others. I think it's always important for you to know what you can and can't find, okay? The other thing that I think is really important for you to know is this individual right here sitting in this pedigree, amongst all these beautifully shaded people, all the shaded people in here have a mutation in alpha-synuclein. It's the same. This person does not. So within this pedigree of people with Parkinson's disease, that disease is common enough that sitting in this pedigree is a person who has a different etiology. So if you had required everybody in this family to have the exact same variant, you would have missed the causative variant in this family. Okay? And that's a really important thing to know as well. Oh, go ahead. So, so this kind of pyramid, is there any special shaded uh, or things? Uh, so, some people we might not know whether they are part of the skin They're both parents and the, the root doesn't have it. Okay. So you want to talk about this person right here? Just in general? Oh, right up here. Oh, yeah. okay. So um, the way this kindred was found, that's a very good question. So the question is, why don't these two people on the top, why isn't one of them shaded? So what you're going to find is this particular kindred actually was um, ascertained, maybe, maybe you care not, through multiple different clinics. They actually come from a region in Italy, the Contursi region, so it's called the Contursi kindred. These people, if you, most of the people that were seen, it's not their name, it's where they're from. Um, most of the people are the people seen in this bottom generation, and some people were seen in this generation. Everything that you've got in the generations above there is historical information. People without blood samples, they're long gone. And so these two people, probably they knew so little about them that they couldn't actually say which of them. It's also possible they died young. It's also possible, though it's not that common in alpha-synuclein, that they might just have been non-penetrant. So the fact that they're not shaded, um, it's actually a great question. It's 
probably um, lack of information rather than actual evidence that it's not, um, neither one of them carries it. Everyone okay? Good question. Okay, so here's the second example. Now I'm making you rethink yourself for a moment. Um, these are mutations in Parkin. So a double line means these two parents are related to each other and they're actually first cousins. So this is an example of consanguinity. So this person, I hope you are not surprised, has an autosomal recessive form of Parkinson's disease. Would you expect this person to carry two different mutations or the same mutation? Same. same. All right, fantastic. So this particular gene was also not found through whole exome sequencing. It's been 10 years, but was found using a lot of consanguinous pedigrees. And these were found, and I, I'm going to give you different themes, originally because these were juvenile onset Parkinson's disease. And that's why I asked you how familiar you were with it. Um, most Parkinson's disease are people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. The original mapping of this locus was um, in Japanese, many of the um, consanguinous pedigrees where they were teenagers when they developed the disease. So very young, very unusual, striking. Inve the investigators correctly realized that this was very likely to be genetic. Okay? Another important thing is there's a lot of variability with this mutation when the people get the disease. So as you get older, um, still early onset, but you're more likely to find a Parkin mutation if you screen a person who onset in their 20s than if you screen someone in their 30s. And most people won't really screen past about 45 because you don't find these mutations very frequently. Okay? Lots of different mutations. Okay? What does that mean? So were you to use whole exome sequencing to find this, this would be a case where if you were smart enough to gather early onset pedigrees and people who had early onset disease, you would have realized that in this gene, you saw clustering of variants across your families. Not in all of them, but in a significant enough number that you became suspicious and would focus in on this gene. It's not how the gene was found, but I want you to think about what pattern you would expect to see if you were to apply that approach now to it. Okay. This is important because we're going to have to deal with this a little later. This is a gene called PARC5. Okay, so once the first couple Parkinson's genes were found, People went, oh, there's obvious pathways there's, that are involved. There's ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Let's look at the genes in that pathway and see if we can find more causes of Parkinson's disease. It's very logical. It's what many of us would do as we find genes now for disease. So one of the investigators who used that approach had a family that looked like this in the right. So there's two siblings that have Parkinson's disease, and they had blood samples on both of them for DNA. There was an uncle who had the disease, and there was a grandmother who had the disease. So when you look at that, what kind of inheritance are you thinking of, maybe? Come on. Are you thinking recessive? Got a bad job. All right. How about dominant? Multiple generations? Males and females affected? How are you going to explain this person right here? Reduced penetrance, maybe? Died young? Maybe? Okay. The problem for these researchers, and this is going to happen in whole exome sequencing with great frequency, is it's a small family. They found a mutation, what they think could be a mutation. Let's start calling it a variant first. They found a variant that both siblings carry. That in and of itself isn't conclusive proof that this is disease producing. It was in this gene that they had tested that was in the right pathway, so biologically it made a lot of sense. They did some further studies, and the mutant form had reduced enzyme activity. And then they went and screened literally hundreds, probably by the time they were done, thousands of cases, and they found no one else who had what could be called a mutation, something that would be predicted to affect the expression or affect the product of this gene. They found no one else. So what does that mean? Where are you left at the end of the day? Two siblings who both have a variant that's predicted to be deleterious. I can show you in studies, reduces enzyme activity, but I can't find anyone else in the world who has something analogous to that. Did this cause the disease in this family or not? We don't know. We still don't know. Okay? If it is the cause in this family, it's a very rare cause. If only this family were bigger, we would be able to test more people and get perhaps more conclusive evidence. The challenge of whole exome sequencing is how often is this going to happen to us? And what are we going to do with that data? Are we ever going to be able to, in essence, seal the deal and convince ourselves that a variant we find is really what caused the disease? And what other tools are you going to need if you want to be able to convince yourself that what you found is really causative? 
Okay, and that's why I think this example, I, I keep this in this lecture. Okay, next thing I want you to think about, so you're, you're getting all different themes, and then we'll go to some real studies, is um, a gene called LARC2. It's the first um, gene that was found that caused later onset Parkinson's disease. It was used again. None of this is found through whole exome sequencing. It's a really, really big gene, 51 exons. Okay, so um, when they had to actually do positional cloning and screen it, it was, it was quite nightmarish for them. But they had a couple things that worked in their favor. There was one predominant mutation that was found in many families. It's this G2019S mutation. It's now the single most common mutation, single variation, that can cause Parkinson's disease. It's about 5% of familial cases. It's more common in familial than it is in sporadic. And I've got a little clock, a set of clocks that I'm going to show you that are going to make a couple points for us. Okay, so bear with me. We're going to have to work our way through this slowly and it's going to tell us a couple things that are going to be important for us. So what these clocks are saying is, every clock tells us about a different study. The dark shaded portion is the proportion of people in that study that carried a LARC2 mutation. So if you start over here on this clock, this was what's from a group of samples called the UK Brain Bank. So very um, exquisitely characterized set of brain samples in the UK, pathologically absolutely confirmed to be Parkinson's disease. When you screen those, about 1.5% of them had a LARC2 mutation. A lot of these are sporadic. They're not a no family history. This is actually my study. So we have about 5% in our familial PD that have this particular mutation. So this is a different kind of sample. This is another uh, individual who also is collecting North American familial Parkinson's. They find it at about 3%. So still almost twice the rate of here. Okay. This is a general North American population still sitting at about 1%. So there's a definite difference between just grabbing people out of a clinic and testing them and familial. Now, here's where it begins to get interesting. Here's a Portuguese clinic, okay? They find this mutation at a frequency of 11%. So that's a lot higher than everything we've been talking about in the general North American population. Let's go to a clinic where it's heavily focused on individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. <coughs> so what does that mean, okay? Just so everyone's clear. Um, among individuals um, who practice Judaism, there are individuals who are of Ashkenazi or, or Sephardic. Ashkenazis tend to be of Eastern European descent, okay? And the frequency of G2019S mutations in that population is almost 25%. And you might say, why is it so much higher? Okay, well, this is not an anomaly in Parkinson's disease. There are other diseases where the frequency of mutation or carriers is much higher. Tay-Sachs disease, um, breast cancer due to BRCA1 mutations. The reason in part is because of cultural and religious reasons, they've tended to only marry within their community. So if a mutation is sitting in that community because of the practices of reproduction, mutations can get to much higher frequency within those communities. And so suddenly you have a mutation at much higher frequency. Okay, Northern African Arabs. We find the frequency, um, this would be Tunisia, primarily, about almost 40% of Parkinson's patients have a mutation in LARC2 in that particular community. A lot of consanguinity, intermarriage. Okay, now take a step back. Here are two different mutations in LARC2. This is one called 1441G, totally different part of the gene. High frequency in the Basques. Anyone know anything about the Basques? They sit in mountains and they are linguistic isolates. So they tend to marry other people who speak Basque and it's geographically more isolated. So for the exact same reasons as in this Ashkenazi Jewish community, a mutation can sit and get in higher frequency because you have a more limited population of individuals reproducing. And if you go to individuals in Taiwan, this is pretty consistent in China as well, there's a different mutation. I don't know if you can see it very well here. It's uh, 2385. That is more common in that population. You almost never see 2019S. Okay, so why did I just do this really long explanation for you? It may matter what the ethnicity of the people are that you're sequencing, and that may be a great tool when you're looking for variants and trying to prioritize in whole exome sequencing. Knowing that half your sample is of Chinese descent, half your sample is North American generic Caucasian descent, you may want to be looking at those samples differently. If you happen to have, I just showed you differences in frequency in a gene. You could have completely different genes potentially acting in people of different ethnicities. Not that unusual, okay? So thinking about the source of DNA samples, which many of us, if we're sitting at a computer, don't always think about, 
can be an incredibly valuable tool that may really speed your search in terms of finding variants of interest. Okay. This reinforces one last point, that idea of penetrance and variable age of onset. And I, I, ha I have to do this because we have to think about who are we going to use as a control. This is looking at age of onset in, in a particular LARC2. It doesn't matter what it is, 1441 in this case. Everyone in this study eventually got the disease because we top out at 100%. What I want you to see is they all carry the same mutation, but their onset varies close to 80 all the way down to about 30. Same mutation, a lot of variability in when you get the disease. So that means even within the same family, you might see that kind of variability. So if you're sitting studying a Parkinson's disease family, and you have two people who have the disease, and they have a sibling who's younger than them, 10 years younger, the fact that they're unaffected at that moment, does that mean they don't carry the disease gene? Are you going to be more comfortable, maybe, with older siblings that are unaffected as compared to younger? Let me take it one step further. When you're looking at controls that you want to compare and say, who is a good control? I don't expect them to have the variant I'm looking for. For many diseases, um, these controls that are children are often not the best place to look for a control when you want to consider whether or not they carry the variant. Does everyone see the implications of your comparison groups? Okay. All right. So that's sort of the whole piece of Parkinson's. You kind of had your, your educational tool. All right. So what I want to do now is walk you through a couple different studies that used whole exome sequencing to identify the disease-producing or disease-causing um, mutation. And when we do this, we're going to walk through, um, we're going to focus on prioritizations. We're going to try to use the things that we've learned here, kind of walk you through the hopefully somewhat accurately the thinking of the people as they were doing these studies. Okay. One thing you're going to see almost all of these studies talk about is reference samples. You've got to have somewhere, if you're going to do whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, that you're going to compare to and say, has this variant been seen previously? Okay? So there's a database of identified SNPs, dbSNP. There's 1,000 genomes, which is also a great resource. Um, different approaches have been used thus far in 1,000 genomes in terms of the coverage, um, in terms of sequencing. But all of these, um, and certainly 1,000 genomes very much so, have become critical reference resources for us. Okay. So I'm going to start with what are still Mendelian diseases. That means diseases where when we look at them, we can tell that they have a single gene basis. Okay? And even though um, the genetic cause of over 3,000 disorders, um, like, like over 3,000 disorders is not known, we have thousands that are known. Most of the ones that remain that haven't been identified is because they're either relatively rare and there are small numbers of families, or the families are quite small. Okay? And so they've not been tractable to the usual approaches to trying to find genes. And that's why most of these are now coming forward for whole exome sequencing. So when you think about what you might want to use, it's sort of a little, a little review. We might want to consider dominant families where we see multiple generations. We might have recessive families where all the affecteds are in a single generation. We might see families where there's only one person in the family. Is it because it's recessive? Is it because of that idea of a de novo mutation like we saw in achondroplasia? And we also have X-linked inheritance. Um, those are both recessive examples. So all of those, and I'm going to talk about instances of each of these um, and how they were used for mapping. Okay. So the first approaches for whole exome sequencing were done in autosomal recessive diseases. And I've sort of given you the punchline. Consanguineous <coughs> pedigrees, where you expect the affected individuals to have the exact same variant, it is a fabulous way to be able to reduce your number of variants very rapidly. So it's a, it, those were some of the very first examples. Even non-consanguineous pedigrees, where the parents are not related to each other, even though you expect to have different mutations in each allele, that's still an incredibly powerful filter. Um, it really, as you'll see, it allows you to narrow down the number of candidate genes very, very quickly. Okay, so here's the first one that we're going to do. This is called Miller syndrome. Okay, so for those of you who are interested, these are two individuals, different races, that both have Miller syndrome. They have facial abnormalities, um, hopefully somewhat obviously. They also have some skeletal abnormalities as well. It was a really good candidate to do whole exome sequencing on because there had been 30 reports in the literature with really good clinical data where people felt confident this really is Miller syndrome. Okay? Among these, there were only three reports that reported more than one person in the family. Okay? So that means 27 of them, it's just one isolated case. 
In each of these multiple cases, there were two affected siblings born to unaffected parents, and the parents were not related to each other. Okay? So the researchers in this study were speculating that maybe this is autosomal recessive. Okay? I'm expecting two mutations, one in each allele. But they had to leave the door open. Well, it could be dominant. It could be that idea of a de novo mutation, just like we saw in achondroplasia, where the parents don't have the mutation. That new mutation occurred during um, meiosis. In those fit rare instances, you might say, how could you get two affected siblings? Well, there's actually things called um, gonadomosaicism, where you actually have the mosaicism in the gonad, so you can actually create multiple eggs or multiple sperm that would actually carry the mutation. So you can come up with plausible ways how that could have happened. Okay. So what they did is they started with the three families that they had. One family that had two affected individuals, and in the other two families, historically there had been more than one person with um, Miller syndrome, but they only had DNA on one. So that means they're doing whole exome sequencing on four samples, two from one family and one each from the two remaining families. Okay? And so what they were going to look for is they're looking for these affected to share either a mutation, not the same mutation, but mutations in the same gene, if it's dominant, or to have two mutations okay, in the same gene across families. So what their strategy was is they were going to do exome sequencing in these four cases. They're going to identify all the coding variants. So they're looking for variants in the exons. In this particular study, it was early enough that there wasn't as much um, reference data, so they actually did some sequencing of controls. They compared to genetic databases that were available. They excluded all the common variants, things that have been previously seen, because their idea was this is a pretty rare disease. We don't expect to see this pretty rare variant sitting in, in common databases. And from that, they were going to come up with a set of candidate genes. Okay, got to squish together. Okay, so I'm going to do this in two pieces. First, I'm giving you a blank table because I don't want you to look at numbers. I just want to explain what you're looking at. Okay, so right here, you're looking at the family that had two children, both of whom had, this, had Miller syndrome. Here's the first offspring. Here's the second offspring. What they then do is they ask, what variants do both of those kids share? Then they go to the second family they have, and they ask, what variants, or in, in what genes, do the first two families share? And then they pull in the third family. So they're looking for finding mutations in the same gene. They're not requiring it to be the same mutation, except for this, this case right here, but they are requiring it to be in the same gene. If you notice, they have both dominant and recessive. They were not confident enough to know which of those patterns of inheritance it was. So they actually pursued this all the way through, considering both possibilities. So when they were looking for dominant, they were just looking for a heterozygous variant. And when they were looking at recessive, they required a variant to be on both alleles. Okay? Okay. So their approach is they first went through, did their sequencing, looked for non-synonymous substitutions, synonymous substitutions, insertion deletions. They filtered out all variants that had been found in DBSNP at that time. They had available to them eight HapMap samples. This is earlier. You would have a lot more resources if you did this now. They filtered out all variants that had been found in eight HapMap samples, again with the idea that this is really rare. It's probably pretty safe to do this. We'll talk about whether or not that's a safe thing to do when you get to more common diseases. So they retained SNPs that weren't found in either, because they figured those would be rare. Then they filtered out variants that weren't predicted to be deleterious. They, they were expecting this to be enough to cause the disease. Okay? So they hoped that they would only be retaining rare SNPs with predicted harmful effects. Okay, so now you have the exact same table, but now we're going to have it filled in. So you start with the first individual. So here are the first two individuals right here. These are how many variants they found. Um, in a non-synonymous uh, sub single sub synonymous substitutions or insertion deletions, if you consider dominant or if you consider recessive. When you require them not to be in dbSNP, you have a dramatic reduction in the number of variants you're working with. Those that are not in HapMap and those eight HapMap, so that's not filtering off of that. Then we combine those two filters together and say, not in either dbSNP or HapMap. We've brought that list quite a bit down. Predicted to be damaging, we're left with 201 variants. They would okay, in a heterozygous form, or six genes in which there were two different variants found <coughs> predicted to be deleterious, okay? 
You couple that now. Here's the second individual. We go through that whole process again. And now we pool the data from each of them because we're expecting those two siblings to have the same genetic cause of the disease. So when we do that, we're down to one gene right here that both siblings have a mutation in each allele predicted to be damaging, not found in dbSNP, not found in the eight HapMap samples. Then they go and combine this data with the remaining two families, and you actually see that if you require it to be damaging, we actually don't have anything left under the recessive model. If we remove that limitation and just say that it has to be two variants in the same gene but not require it to be damaging, we're down to one gene here. And if you look at the dominant cases, you have about 26 here and you're down to about eight genes right there. So they had a very tractable number of genes and variants that they could look at. And after they looked at the genes that were nominated, went back and considered how good our prediction programs, they decided that there was one variant that was not predicted to be deleterious, but in the other families, there were two different deleterious mutations in every instance, but one of them that was not predicted to be. And they said, we still think that's probably the gene, and we probably have problems with prediction. Okay? So, just to see it visually, they're focusing on all the coding regions, also considering splice donor sites, splice acceptor sites. By looking at this commonality across our kindreds and across databases, narrowing it down to just what's in common, lifting off that requirement that it be deleterious, they had the candidate gene. Okay? Now you might say, is this enough to prove it? Well, they did have more things to go with. Okay? So they had a total of six families. I showed you whole exome sequencing for three families. Remember, it was four individuals, three families. They had three more families that they went and did screening in, and they found mutations in this gene as well. So then they were co collecting more and more data, all pointing toward this gene, and I think they made a pretty compelling case that across these six families, and the reason you have 11 variants, I've got to find the right variant, there's one variant that, here it is, that's seen in two families. That's why you actually have 11 variants across these six families. Okay, pretty compelling case. I think everyone agreed they had found the correct gene for this disease. Okay, so they again had used this filtering approach. A key element, and I hope it really comes across, is being able to prioritize variants if it's not in dbSNP and not in those HapMap samples. That was a very powerful filter for them. I think it's important to know what you can't find with this approach. Okay, maybe an issue with finding deletions and duplications depending on the size of them approach that you're using. You may have some difficulty with those. Depending on um, epigenetic variation could potentially also be challenging. Cytogenetic rearrangements, we've been talking about that a lot in a project that we're doing. Will you be able to pick up a cytogenetic rearrangement? And does anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? So if you break off a piece of one chromosome and you attach it to another chromosome, that could cause the disease if that breaking occurs in the middle of a gene. Okay? You may not be able to pick that up when you do this kind of an approach. So there are things that you will miss and that you will not have the power to identify. Okay, we're going to do another example. We've got a couple more examples that we're going to do. Okay, so this is a baby that was born. And what was striking about this baby was its total cholesterol. So I don't know how many of you know your cholesterol, but this person, this little kid, had a cholesterol of 640. If any of you had that, you probably would be, I don't know, medicated, I would think, if you, it was known. So this is pretty high to have in a baby. And the parents, which are these two individuals right here, did not have elevated cholesterol. So they were thinking, perhaps this is something, what are you thinking when you look at that? Are you thinking recessive maybe? New mutation or recessive? How about we think recessive? Okay. So the child had some unusual findings. Okay. They thought it looked autosomal recessive. This child had what's called hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol. So they screened the genes that are knows, known to cause severe hypercholesterolemia, and they didn't find any mutations. It's going to become important, but there's a disorder called cytosterolemia. They ruled it out because they did the standard test that you would be doing, and they did not see any evidence for that diagnosis. I've probably told you that for a reason, and you'll realize that in a moment. Okay, so what they did is they decided to do whole exome sequencing in this child. So they found a total number of SNPs. Now, that's all SNPs. That's not deleterious. That's everything that you find. 
Okay, so you've got a very, very large number right here. We immediately try to break it down and ask what are non-synonymous splice site SNPs. We've reduced ourselves down to less than 1%. Then we start saying, let's only focus on those variants that are not in DB SNP. Let's focus on those variants. They now had 21 exomes available. Let's ask, um, since I'm expecting it to be recessive, remember, let's look only at those genes that have more than one SNP that has, in other words, more than one variant in it. And then let me make sure that those, both of those variants are nonsense SNPs, okay? And then you're down to one gene. Ooh, careful, sorry. They're able to show that e each of those SNPs, um, one is carried on the mother's chromosome, one's carried on the father, so both parents are carriers. The only thing that was surprising was that this gene was already known, and it was already known to cause a disease called cytosterolemia. So it wasn't that they actually found a new gene. They found a gene that was previously known. What they realized, and the reason they published it is, that they hadn't made the right diagnosis. In essence, they made the diagnosis when they got the molecular test result back. Because then they went, how did we miss this? Why did we not realize that this was the diagnosis? And they realized that it was all about the timing of when they had evaluated the patient to have cytosterolemia. It's actually, the problem is, her plasma sterol concentrations increased as she, you know, I don't want to say aged, but as she grew up in, into a toddler. And so if they had known and waited until she was two years old, they actually would have made the right clinical diagnosis. The problem was they realized there was something wrong much earlier, and they were trying to make a diagnosis before the whole clinical picture was there. It's probably not unrealistic to think that this is going to happen more and more often, that we're actually going to be able to realize what an individual has in terms of the diagnosis through molecular testing, rather than actually realizing the clinical features and realizing what the disorder is. And so that's actually why this, this paper got published. So in essence, it's a case of whole, um, not genome, whole exome sequencing making a diagnosis. Okay, this is a, just a single slide. Um, do I tell you? Yeah, I tell you it's autosomal recessive. So you've got double lines in a whole bunch of places. If you haven't guessed auto, autosomal recessive with consanguinity, I probably have not done my job well. Um, so this is a case of non-syndromic um, hearing loss. So everyone who's shaded has hearing loss, and if you look, they're offspring of consanguineous parents. And since they're all in a family, you're going to expect them to carry the same mutation. So imagine the power of being able to do screening. All you need to do is screen, you know, a couple of these people, okay? Maybe do a couple unaffected people if you want to. All you're looking for is a homozygous mutation, and they pop the gene out very, very quickly. Big family, lots of affecteds, knew exactly that it had to be a homozygous mutation. Okay, this is the last kind of general example, and then we'll go on um, to sort of a little bit of study design. So these kids all have a disorder um, called Kabuki syndrome, okay? Um, relatively unusual disorder. Um, these kids had all been diagnosed. Um, they don't all look exactly the same. You have some ethnic variation among the kids. Some kids are a little bit more severe than others. That's going to actually be important in a couple slides. But researchers collected um, DNA from these 10 kids and said, this is the perfect moment for whole exome sequencing. Let's go look for um, a mutation that's causing Kabuki syndrome. Okay. So its incidence is about 1 in 32,000. There are only about 400 cases that are reported worldwide, and they've all been sporadic. There have been a small number of families where there appeared to be some parent-child transmission. Um, and because of the small number of reports, these investigators speculated that maybe this was dominant. Maybe. Okay. I'm not going to sneeze. Okay. Yes, they have. <coughs> Sorry. So there's variability in what these kids look like. And the speculation was um, there might be some misdiagnosis among these kids. So are we always confident? This is so rare. Do all clinicians make this diagnosis correctly? So there was a little bit of concern whether or not this gene could be found. So the approach that they took was they sequenced 10 unrelated kids, all of whom were reported to have Kabuki syndrome. There were seven Caucasian, two Hispanic, and one child of mixed ancestry. Okay? And the idea was that they would try to identify genes that had at least one variant, and they would be looking for non-synonymous variants. They would be looking at splice acceptor donor site mutations and insertion deletion. So they were looking for something that might be in an exon and potentially causative. So here's what they got when they did this the first time. 
So here are the 10 kids laid across um, kind of the x-axis or across the top of this figure. Okay? So what they did is they sequenced the first individual right here. We've got 12,000 um, non-synonymous non-synonymous substitutions and insertion deletions. We've got a little over 7,000 that are not in dbSNP and not in 1,000 genomes. Okay? About 7,800 of them are not in control genomes. If we say they can't be in either, we get ourselves to a little under 7,000. And about 753 of them are predicted to be a, a result in a loss of function. Okay? We still have, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of things that we're still dealing with. Okay? Probably more than we can manage. So what they then did is they, they marched across. They said, well, let me accumulate. So I'm going to start with what I find, but as I work my way across, I'm going to say, so among those 753, how many genes did this individual also have a variant in that was predicted to be deleterious, that was not in 1,000 genomes, that was not in dbSNP? So you reduce from 753 to 49 when we look at the intersection of genes in individuals 1 and 2. When we add individual 3, we reduce that intersection to 7. And as you work your way across, we get down to one gene at patient 7. And then, if you look over here, when we get to patients 8, 9, and 10, we don't have anything left in terms of loss of function. We have one gene left if we say that it's not in control, exomes is not a thousand genomes, it's a reasonable kind of um, variant, but we don't, we don't require it to be a loss of function. So they did go and look at this one gene. The problem was um, this one gene in which everybody had a variant was a very unlikely candidate. It was a very, very large gene. It was very likely to have variants in it because it was such a large gene. And they really walked away from it and said, we don't think this is the right answer. But the problem was, where do they back up to? Okay? And what could be the reasons why this experiment didn't work the way they planned? Does anyone have any ideas? Oh, you know the answer already, do you? Do you already know the answer? No. Oh, okay, fair, okay. This diagnosis, then you get full credit for that answer. Okay, so maybe they got it wrong. Maybe not all these kids have Kabuki syndrome. Here I am trying to make them all have a mutation in the same gene, and if they don't all have the same disease, that's probably not going to work. So they recognized that, and that's exactly what they began to worry about. They began to worry that there might be more than one gene that causes this disease. It could be that maybe the right gene, they didn't get all the exons. Maybe it was just poor coverage. I mean, they started speculating. Maybe the mutations weren't in exons, or maybe they just got it. Maybe the diagnosis was not right. So they did something that I thought was really, really clever. And maybe, let me go back to that previous slide so you'll see what they did. So when I showed you the pictures of these kids, they all were numbered. And what they did is they actually looked at the features. They had clinicians look at the features of the kids, and they said, we're going to rate these kids and put them basically in numerical order, for number one being the most complete, absolutely, I am absolutely confident of this diagnosis. And in essence, working your way toward the least confident or the least classic face for Kabuki syndrome. And rather than just randomly adding the kids in, we're going to add them in looking for mutations at, in, a, in order of our confidence in the diagnosis. Okay? So when I get to the end, if I don't have something, that's okay. I can work my way backwards, and whatever point I stop and I have something where I have maybe a gene or a couple genes, I'm going to work my way forward from there. And that's going to let me be hopefully okay in terms of this misdiagnosis if I capture it correctly in this ordering. Okay. So the first one is the table that they did originally where they just kind of tossed the kids in and they weren't thinking that way. Here, they're sequentially being added in terms of our confidence. So they're least confident in this individual, most confident in this individual. And so it shouldn't surprise you that if you compare this individual number one and this individual number one, they aren't the same person. Because if you look at this pattern of variance, it's quite different. Okay, so they started with a different person. Right there, things are different. Okay, exact same table. We work our way across. We work our way across pulling out things that aren't in dbSNP, aren't in 1,000 genomes. We look at loss of function, and we find ourselves stopping at, at patient four with just one gene. We dropped really fast from 25 to 1, and we sat there. So if you're a betting person, why not start there, and let's take a look at what we've got. Okay. Well, they did look again, in all of their cases again, at that one gene. This is a gene called MLL2. 
they were able, after they did additional sequencing, so not just the whole exome sequencing that they'd gotten from the project, they convinced themselves that they really believed in this gene, and they were going to redo the work themselves, okay? They were able to eventually find mutations in nine of the ten cases, convincing themselves pretty well. They pulled out some additional ca cases of Kabuki syndrome, realized how much work they're doing. This is a 54 exon gene. They're able to find mutations in 26 of these 43 cases. So now they've got a mutation in this gene in 35 of these 53 families, so about two-thirds of the families, okay? In a gene, when they originally required everybody, they'd missed. Now, what I want you to remember, though, is it, it did end up being in nine of the ten, which tells you that there had been, in terms of this, if you go back and look at these loss of functions, some of these variants were not correctly predicted and some were indeed missed. Okay, so we have, um, and they actually had 12 cases that had DNA from both parents. Why does that matter? Now you can ask about origin. How did this mutation happen? The mutation wasn't found in any of those parents, which means this is really probably just like achondroplasia, a de novo mechanism. You have a mutation that's occurring in meiosis that's causing this disease. So what they ended up finding is these are all the different mutations they find. They, they spread out, not in every exon. They are, do tend to be clustered in some of the larger exons, which maybe isn't all that surprising, okay? A um, variety of different mechanisms that you can speculate, but because they had good samples to begin with, good clinical data, more samples to go to when they wanted to convince themselves they were looking at the right gene. It's the whole package that let them really convince others that they have the right gene. If you did this with just one family, you could have a lot of trouble. Okay, and this is just one last example to give you an X-linked example. So this is two males that have um, this disorder, two males from whom they were able to do, um, get DNA and were able to use for screening. The women have to be carriers because they have multiple affected sons. And using the exact same approach, this is just to make sure you realize it doesn't matter what inheritance, you can do it. You take those two kids, um, two men, um, do screening on them, look um, for all the variants that you can find, variants that change nucleotides, limit yourself to the X chromosome because you know it's X-linked. That's a fabulous filter. Work your way all the way down. They got themselves down um, to four nucleotide changes. They only had four genes to work with, and then they were able to quickly pull out the gene. Okay? So, Overall, if you have a disease, clear etiology, you know who's affected, you know who's unaffected, you know what you're looking for in terms of an inheritance pattern, it can be really very tractable to use this approach to find um, the causative gene. So what I want you to do is think for a moment about using this um, maybe in a more complicated case, which is what I do, which is a disease that maybe isn't as straightforward, and what are we going to do with those? Okay. So diseases even that have common, you know, common etiology, um, sometimes you can find, even within the same family, different genetic causes. So I want you to go back and think about that alpha-synuclein example. Remember that big pedigree, that Contursi kindred? All those people with an alpha-synuclein mutation, and there sat that one person who didn't have it. It's not that unusual when you deal with something common. So when you get to diseases that have a frequency of 10% in the population, okay, and you have multiple people in the family have the disease, it's not unrealistic to think that they could have the disease for different causes. So the challenge then is it may not be wise to assume that everyone in the family has the same variant. Realize that was an incredibly powerful filter for every study we were looking at here. When you lift that up, your number of variants goes up dramatically as well. Okay? So it's great when you can use it. When you can't, it just means you're going to have a lot more variants to work with. Things that can make this problem more tractable for you is if you, have, um, if you have maybe lots of replication samples. So maybe this disease is really complicated, but I have a thousand people with the disease. Well, if I find a genetic cause, if I'm lucky at all, I'm going to find a couple more people with that cause, and that's going to give me added impetus. If I'm unlucky, and you remember that Parkinson's case where we had that family with two siblings, screened thousands of cases and never found it again, you might be in the same boat you're not going to be able to convince anyone that you actually found something important, okay? So having lots of samples that you can screen is potentially really helpful. So I wanted to show you a couple families without telling you all your answers, see what we remember, okay? So here's a family. This is actually Parkinson's disease. These are all families that we're actually um, have done whole exome sequencing on. So this is a family that has three siblings with the disease. I haven't shown you the rest of the family. So there's no one else in the family who has the disease. 
This person onset at 36, this person at 43, and this person at 58. I have DNA on all three of them. What do you think we should do? What should we look for? I don't know the answer, so I, we don't know what the gene is, so you can guess as well as I can. What do you think? What do you want to try? Could be autosomal recessive, and if it is the case, what are you going to look for in your variants? What do you expect me to find? Two variants in the gene, and you're going to, are you going to expect all of them to share it? Let's start with that assumption. Okay, so let's start by trying that. They're all kind of earlier onset, maybe not this one as much, but the other two are pretty early. Okay, I might use this later on and say if I can't find anything that I'm really interested in, maybe this person has a different etiology because he's got it a little, she's got it a little bit later. But recessive seems pretty reasonable. How about this family over here? What do you think you're going to do with them? What's your first pass on them? All right, maybe you need some help with what, knowing what you're looking at. If that's your problem, you don't like my shading, I'm going to give you an out. So fully shaded people definitely have Parkinson's disease. Half shaded people have a lot of features, but not quite enough to make a diagnosis. Quarter shaded people, the family tells us they have Parkinson's disease. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I didn't get to see them. Does that help a little bit? Now, now you've got three siblings definitely have Parkinson's. Two certainly have some features. This one, the family tells us, mother doesn't seem to have it, but her two brothers do, and so did her father, at least they tell us. What do you think? What might you want to try? Want to try dominant? Maybe? Don't like it? We may not, maybe I'm wrong. I would probably try dominant first. Would you want to use these two people right away? What do you think? You're not as confident about them. You're not sure if they have it or not. They have some features, but not all of them. What do you think? Unfortunately, this is real life. Those pedigrees that I showed you in those, in those early ones, those, those diseases are all getting mapped by other people. You're not going to get those. <laughs> You're going to get stuck with these. So you have multiple generations. I would be tempted to say that. So you have parent to child transmission. This could be reduced penetrance. Maybe she died young. Who knows? I, I don't have an insight set. So I would say reduce, I mean, I would be tempted to reduce penetrance. It could be that maybe, this, maybe they're all wrong about that family report. Maybe this is really recessive. So you probably want to hedge your bets and do it both ways. I think I'd probably start with the fully shaded people first. I think I'd probably start there and maybe start to look at these other people later on. It's going to be, a, I mean, that, at the family it's going to be challenging. How about this one over here? What are you going to do with them? So this family has three people, a mother and her son. Son got it at 50, mother got it at 74, her sister got it at 64. She's actually had a, a brain autopsy, which has confirmed the diagnosis. And they have a sister who's died at age 74. She didn't have the disease. But we do have DNA on her. What could you do? What could you do? We could, do you want to do, you want to do whole exome sequencing on her, do you think? What are you going to look for? Do you expect her to share or not share variants? Now, she, she was seen at 74 and didn't have symptoms. Her sister got it at 74. So that would be my one hesitation is, could she still carry the variant and not have it? Could. So this is a family where most people probably wouldn't use this person right away. You're not quite certain what to make of them yet. You could start with these three and look what they share. You could consider dominant. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. And if it's dominant, you're looking for a variant in a variant they all would share, but you're going to have a lot of them because there are only three people in that family. And by definition, a mother and son share half their genome. They, they just, they just, you've got to get something from her. So I think this is really the challenge in... Um, it, everything could be recessive. The, the world is unfortunately our oyster, and we're going to be just like that study that had to do dominant, recessive, dominant, recessive, dominant, recessive, because we're not certain. We're, we'll probably have to do it multiple ways. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's not, it's not clear-cut like some of the other, other pedigrees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any one of these, I think you could argue that case. Um, so a couple other things you can do is if you have a reason to know where to look because of previous knowledge, 
like that X chromosome, they limited themselves just to the X chromosome. If you have a reason to know that you want to go on a particular chromosome to go look, that could be a really effective way to do whole exome sequencing, or you could do a custom design and just um, design for that region. A lot of people are doing whole exome sequencing because it's actually almost cheaper than to do any kind of a custom array anymore. Um, so you're going to have a lot of variants to consider. And so depending on whether you're doing families or sporadic cases, it's going to give you very, very different pieces of information. So I think in general, um, you're, the general scheme I think most people are, are kind of sitting with, and we're, I think you're going to talk about this today, is that you're going to get a lot of variants. You have to have some kind of filtering mechanism, whether it's dbSNP and 1,000 genomes. If you're confident in your disease and you're confident in people who aren't unaffected, you could look for things that aren't found in your unaffected family members. A complexity that hopefully I showed you was that um, we're not perfect at making our diagnosis either. And so people make mistakes. We're all human. And so um, you can miss a gene if you're too rigid and require everybody to have a mutation in it. So in many cases now, for a number of studies, we're loosening that up a little bit. Every time you loosen it, you pick up a whole bunch more variants. You can consider whether or not you want to limit variants that are predicted to have an effect on the protein. Prediction programs, have you talked about them at all yet? Um, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. I think most people like the idea of being able to, whatever novel variants they have, have somewhere to go screen for them. People like to have controls um, in addition to 1,000 genomes. And I think having other people with the disease, whether it's families or cases, just having more places to look if you do find something is probably very important. Okay. So what are you going to miss with this approach? Okay. So um, Dr. Liu, if he, hasn't, if he hasn't stressed his own interests, you should have. Promoters, introns, 3 prime UTR. You're probably going to miss most anything that's in there that's important. That's not what whole exome sequencing is designed to find. And there are certainly disorders that are caused by mutations and variations in those regions. Not all exons always get sequenced. Some exons get poorly covered. Some regions get poorly covered. If you're an unlucky person and that's exactly where what you're looking for is, you're going to miss it. If you remember that one study, they had to go back and sequence on their own. It was a big gene, but by doing that, they grabbed back all of their mutations that had been missed. So I think you have to be prepared that um, there's not a lot of good numbers, but there are some people who are saying maybe only one in 10, maybe one in five of these studies are actually successful in finding the gene when they use whole exome sequencing. Okay, so I think there's a lot of excitement about this approach. I think it's certainly going to identify the genetic basis for some disorders, as you've seen. I think it's going to have the potential to give you diagnosis on some people based on their molecular findings. And I think you're going to find subsets of patients with complex disorders that actually turn out to have a Mendelian form of the disease. Okay, so I don't know, do they have a test in this class? What happens to them? Do they have a test in here? Yeah. Oh, so you not have a test. today. Not today. Of course not today. Oh, no, no. So just to, to reiterate what was kind of important in what I said, though, okay? I don't know, just, just in case. What I think is important. So you learned basic patterns of inheritance, dominant, recessive. You knew what to look for. You knew what that meant in terms of finding variants. You saw how to apply those patterns to trying to find um, disease genes and how important it might be to know that if you want to actually have a way to prioritize among the many, many variants you're going to find. And hopefully we've talked about ways that you could interpret results that you're going to have to consider how am I going to winnow down those variants, how am I going to prioritize them, am I going to base on what they're predicted to do, whether or not they're found in controls, does it matter what my disease is, does it matter if my disease is likely to be in those people in 1,000 genomes. If you're doing cardiovascular disease and you're looking for genes for it, if you find a variant in 1,000 genomes, that probably isn't a reason to exclude it. Okay, so it really matters. For Miller syndrome, it's probably pretty safe though. So it really depends on what it is you're studying. And you certainly have earned a break. <laughs>